Starting and maintaining a growing space without digging or disturbing the soil has become a very popular method or approach among gardeners and growers for very good reasons. One of the main reasons for not digging or cultivating the soil, or at least keeping it to a minimum, is so that the soil ecosystem is not disturbed. And for a lot of people, that simply comes down to a desire not to kill things unnecessarily. There are also other potential benefits, such as uh, maintaining soil organic matter and reducing erosion. But a lot of this comes back to the simple idea that a healthy, undisturbed soil ecosystem is ultimately better for the plants, and therefore better for those of us who want to grow them. There is also a belief that it is a lot less work, that no-dig methods avoid the hard, backbreaking work of digging the soil, or the need to use machinery to do the job. One of the gardens that I manage as part of this Red Gardens project is a no-dig garden, which I'm developing to explore the possibilities and issues of avoiding this potentially unnecessary hard work, and hopefully reaping the benefits of a healthier soil ecosystem. In general, I found this garden to be easier and less time consuming to establish, but I have experienced some issues that are not so easy to deal with, and I'm not sure if I'm gaining the full potential benefit of this no-dig method yet. I originally started this garden using a permaculture approach of covering the ground with a thick layer of undecomposed organic matter. This was a popular idea within the echo chamber that I was in at the time, and I felt that it would allow me to take advantage of the resources that I had readily available to me. I used cardboard to smother the existing vegetation, covered with comfrey and nettles cut from areas around the gardens, as well as grass clippings cut with a scythe or lawnmower and some straw. The main idea was that this deep bed of material would kill off the existing grasses and other plants, supercharge the soil life, and boost the nutrient and organic matter in the soil in a way that mimicked natural ecosystems. Compared to the gardens that I dug over, it was definitely easier to establish this no-dig garden once I was able to collect all of the material that I needed, but I struggled growing food in this garden for the first few, few seasons. The mulch that I had applied didn't last long enough to completely kill off some of the persistent weeds, especially the scotch or cooch grass, and the layer of material became a perfect breeding ground for slugs, which is one of the main garden pests around here. I also noticed that there was a fairly poor germination and slower growth rate in the spring, but that was most likely because the mulch was preventing the soil from warming up. So while it was an easy method to use to establish a garden, I found it was more difficult to grow food using this method, which seems much more appropriate for warmer and drier climates than what we deal with here in Ireland. Of course, other growers have had similar issues, and thankfully alternate no-dig methods have been developed that are possibly more appropriate for temperate climates. For the last few seasons, I've been following the advice of Charles Dowding and a few other people, and using a mulch of properly decomposed compost on the surface of the soil to establish and maintain this garden. This method is definitely much more appropriate for this climate, as it doesn't provide a home for slugs, and the darker color of the compost helps the soil warm up in the spring. But it takes a lot of compost to do this, and I would use up most of the compost that I could make in a season, leaving none for the other gardens, so I had to bring in compost supplies from elsewhere. The first season that I was trying this method, I had help bringing in a few trailer loads of partially decomposed horse manure and bedding, which wasn't an easy task, but at least I was able to get the bulk supplies that I needed to do the job of mulching the full garden. For the last two seasons, I've decided to buy in compost from a supplier in the region, and although it's not great quality or very fertile, it is clean and free of weed seeds, and easily available in the quantities that I needed. It was definitely easier to pay someone else to make it and to deliver it reasonably close to the gardens, although I still needed to haul many wheelbarrow loads of compost up the hill to the garden. Apart from the task of hauling in so much bulk material, this garden is definitely less work than the gardens where I still dig over the soil, but there were a couple of unexpected issues last year. The weed seeds that were on the surface of the soil had been triggered to germinate before I had added the compost in early April, and were able to make their way up through the layer of compost. This was unexpected but relatively easy to deal with, and probably would have been prevented if I had added a layer of compost much earlier in the year or the previous autumn. I also ended up with a lot of excessively forked carrots, with the forking mostly occurring near the top of the root, and this seemed to coincide with where the new layer of compost met the existing garden bed underneath. I'm not sure exactly why this happened, but it was likely because the layer of compost had not had a chance to settle in, and the tiny roots of the carrot seedlings didn't react well to the abrupt change from one material to the other. 
There were also issues with uneven or sporadic germination of smaller direct sown seeds. And I think that this was probably because the compost that I used seemed to dry out quite quickly, at least at first. I think that most of these issues would have been solved by better timing of the addition of compost. And it would have been easier to manage and easier to get a good crop of some vegetables if I had added all the compost in the previous autumn, which would have given it time to mature and settle in. The detailed soil test that I took earlier this spring showed high levels of soil organic matter and high nutrient holding capacity when compared to the other gardens. And this is to be expected given that I've added so much organic matter to this garden over the last few seasons. It will be interesting to see how the levels of organic matter will change as I continue to add substantial amounts of compost to the surface each season and where this fertility will level off at. The amount of nutrients found in the soil test was quite high for some of the minerals, but low for others, and I suspect that the levels of potassium may be too high, and will continue to get higher as I add more compost. I was concerned that the compost that I bought in last year wasn't very high in nitrogen or phosphorus, so I decided to spread some chicken manure pellets and soft rock phosphate over this layer of compost to compensate for this. Ideally, it should not be necessary to add additional fertility, but so much seems to depend on the quality of the compost that I can get, and the better the compost, the better the yields could potentially be. So far, I haven't been overly impressed with what I've been able to harvest out of this garden compared to some of the other gardens. Some of this is due to crop failures for various reasons, in some cases because of the timing of when I added the compost, and I suspect that things will improve when the lower fertility compost has had a chance to decompose some more. Some crops did quite well compared to the other gardens, but others were rather poor, and I didn't feel that the plants were as healthy or robust as they were in some of the other gardens, or at least that was the impression that I had last year. So far, I don't feel that I'm getting the benefits of this method, at least in terms of reaping an abundance from the large input of fertility, and I don't really know how to evaluate the health of the soil and what benefits I may be getting from not disturbing it. I suspect that this coming season will be a better judge of the possible benefits of this method. The biggest issue that I've had with this garden is dealing with persistent weeds, some of which survive the initial covering mulch and others keep coming in from the edge of the garden. There is still a bit of creeping or Canadian thistle, which has horizontal roots deep in the soil, but that weed has been reasonably easy to suppress. I've had more of an issue with stray raspberry plants that have escaped the abandoned neighbouring garden. This interconnected underground root system has crept several meters into my no-dig garden and sends up suckers which are often strong or persistent enough to push through the cardboard and mulch, and I'm not sure what to do about it beyond cutting off any suckers that I see. But my main problem is scutch or cooch grass, with clumps persisting from the initial mulching and new roots coming into the growing space from some sections of the grass paths that surrounds the gardens. I have issues with scutch grass in the other gardens as well, but there I can simply dig out the rhizome root system when I'm cultivating the soil, and any pieces of the root that I miss can easily be pulled out of the loose soil. Even though it goes against the no-dig method, I have occasionally resorted to carefully digging out some of the patches of this problematic weed from this no-dig garden in the past, but it's not something that I want to do. And the pieces of the root that are always left behind are usually impossible to pull out from the firmer soil. Regular hoeing to slowly deplete the root of its energy is one option, but it takes a persistence that I rarely have, and it's not really effective when the roots are still connected to the plants outside of the garden area. The easiest and most obvious solution in this garden is to add more cardboard and paper and cover with more compost. And this is what I've done this season with this section of the garden where I'm going to be growing squash, potatoes and courgettes, which are all large plants that can be planted through the cardboard. But this is not really an option in areas where I want to grow carrots, lettuce, and a range of smaller plants. The best option is probably to take the time to cover the entire garden, to start again. And this is something that I've thought of doing it in the past, but I didn't want to delay or lose a growing season. And there's no guarantee that these weeds won't make it back into the garden again. Out of all the gardening methods that I'm exploring, this no-dig garden is definitely the easiest to establish and generally for ongoing maintenance. And with all the compost that I'm adding, it's potentially the easiest way to get high yields from a garden, but I haven't really seen that yet. But the continuing problems with persistent types of weeds raises an interesting issue with this no-dig method. That it's not an easy garden to correct or fix issues with weeds without starting again with more cardboard and compost. 
Although this isn't necessarily a problem, there are associated costs and potential delays, or at the very least I won't be able to plant some crops for a while in these sections. While it can be a lot harder and more work to establish and maintain the other gardens which rely on digging the soil, it can be easier to correct some issues that arise in these gardens and to not miss part of the growing season. This has been a useful lesson for me. The other gardens have taught me that I can let things go for a bit, such as leaving the scutch grass to become a little bit more established, as I can quickly fix it later. But that's not really the case with this no-dig garden, or at least with how I've been managing it. If I falter, I generally need to start again. So for this garden, I need to develop a different frame of mind or focus to make sure that the potential benefits and ease of this no-dig method are not lost.